All right, guys, um, bear with me. I still got a little bit of a cold. So I'm got the sniffles. <laughs> See? So um, here we go. Take careful notes. This is an extremely important concept. It's a complicated concept, but it's very important that we understand what we're going to call today the paradox of liberty and slavery. Paradox meaning how two things can go coexist at the same time that are in opposition to each other, right? It's a real paradox. You can have a country based on the concept of liberty, yet at the same time, that country in many ways relies on slavery. And these two things are in opposition to one another, hence a paradox. For example, Patrick Henry declared, give me liberty or give me death. He also said, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of slavery? He's talking about the British in the Revolutionary War. Of course, Patrick Henry was a famous Virginian who owned slaves. And he said, give me liberty or give me death, right? George Washington, no introduction needed there. He said that there is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for gradual abolition or ending of slavery. But this has never happened. He owned hundreds of slaves, uh, even when he was president and up until the day that he died. But he never freed them, right? So how do we explain this, this paradox that we had this country that very much believed in liberty and freedom, yet relied entirely on slavery. Well, at first, it was explained as a necessary evil. So that's part one. Make sure you really understand this. At first, it was described as a necessary evil. What does this mean, a necessary evil? Well, it's something that, that was, it was a bad thing, and everyone knew it was a bad thing. Washington knew it was a bad thing. Jefferson knew it was a bad thing. But it was necessary at the time to make society uh, survive, to, to uh, allow the economy to survive, to, to allow the South to thrive. Now, you could argue that that's not the, true at all, but the point is that's how they saw it. They knew slavery was a bad thing, but it was necessary. So how does this idea that slavery was an evil thing disappear in the South? Well, what changes in the Southern economy? A famous senator from South Carolina, James Henry Hammond, said, quote, no power on earth dares to make war upon it. Cotton is king. So what's he mean here? What cotton? Well, we've talked a lot about cotton already and how important it is to the southern economy, how it is important it is to the nation's economy. Why does slavery stop being seen as evil? Because slavery quickly becomes the, the main way that cotton is able to be produced, and cotton is king. So let's look at this a little bit more. Cotton is king. Here's um, a famous painting of, of slaves bending over to pick cotton out of the fields. By 1830, cotton represented half of all American exports. Half. That means half of everything that we exported or traded to other countries was cotton. But think about how this impacts the national economy. The rest of the country is reliant upon this moneymaker to kickstart our national economy. By 1860, two-thirds or 75% roughly, of the world's total supply. I know two-thirds is not 75%, but three-fourths, three-fourths, 75%. God, stupid. I always meant to change this, but I always forget. And now I'm embarrassed once more. I know that two-thirds is not 75%. Three-fourths of the world's total supply, 75% of the world's cotton supply came from the American South, right? So, again, how can we, and I'm talking about the South here, how can Southerners destroy the idea of slavery is evil. They don't want to see it as evil anymore because it's so important. It's king. It's so important to their economy and their culture. But, you know, how do you make slavery okay? Well, let's look at one tactic. The Alabama Agricultural Society had a pamphlet that read, quote, our condition or the, the South condition is quite different from that of the non-slaveholding sections of the United States or the North, right? The North and the Midwest did not allow slaves. So that's who he's talking about. Their laborers, the northern laborers, are merely hirelings, while with us, our laborers are property. So what's he saying here? Well, in the north, like this woman right here, the women in the north, workers in the north, they toiled away in the factories. They were just hired out. They were wage workers, right? In the south, the laborers, the slaves, are property, right? You're under complete control, but they're also constantly being taken care of. That's what he's going to argue. 
What the South will start to argue is that in the North, they had something called white wage slavery, that white people, that white workers were paid a wage, but they were enslaved by the wage. Remember, we talked about wage workers last time. And again, drink a tea. And they're arguing, what's worse, the fact that we have permanent slaves who constantly have a job, or is it worse to be a white person in the North who never knows if they have a job? Another strategy, a very important concept called paternalism. Pater means father, right? So paternalism talks about how slave masters were paternal or fatherly figures to their slaves. They took care of them. This is a famous image. This is a slave nurse, um, and this is a white, um, ma her master's son, who she took care of his entire life, right? This, the idea here is that they are family. Now, this is a kind of a messed up concept, but this is how Southerners justified slavery, right? That listen, slaves are inferior, and they can't really take care of themselves. So we white Southerners are, are going to be father figures, family figures, and take care of them. Here's a, a quick look at some arguments here, right, of how this works. The Negro in his own country up here, there's a slave in Africa. Look, people are starving. Here's the skeletons. He's got a spear. He looks very primitive. Or the Negro in America, right? Here is the Southern master, his wife, his children, and here are the slaves. Right? They look pretty happy. They look civilized. And that's what the South wanted to argue. In fact, what the South is going to ultimately say, taking all these to ideas together, they're going to say that, that slavery is a positive thing. It's a positive good, not an evil thing, but a positive thing. And one of the, the guys who made this argument the most is this really crazy, insane looking guy over here, John C. Calhoun. So he said, many in the South once believed that slavery was a moral and political evil, right? The necessary evil concept. We talked about that at the beginning. Everyone thought, well, yeah, it's a bad thing, but we need it right now. But that is folly and delusion. It's, it's no longer around, right? We don't think that way now. We now see, we see it now in its true light. We see slavery for what it is. And regard slavery as the most safe and stable basis or foundation for free institutions in the world. And what he's arguing is slavery is what makes uh, the South and Southern society possible. And it's, it's a good thing to have it around. But the key is it's not just good for white masters and white Southerners, but it's good for slaves too. Right? That's what the South is going to try to argue. I know this sounds really weird and crazy, but remember, they got to figure out a way to mentally emotionally justify slavery as a uh, concept or an idea. One Virginia planter, planter being a slave master, said, quote, the master should always bear in mind that he is the guardian and protector of his slaves, who, if well treated, are the happiest laboring class in the world. So protect your slaves, treat them well, and they'll be very, very happy. Right? Yet, if you think about it, a master could use uh, whatever means necessary, or whatever type of punishment or, or discipline he needed to ensure that he got labor or work from their slaves. As one former slave remembered, if you don't done your task, driver wave that whip, put you over a barrel, and beat you so blood run down. So at the end of the day, who has all the control? Well, it's the master, and it's, it's a vi it can be a violent um, punishment, a violent control. For example, this is a famous image of a slave, and, and uh, these marks on his back are whelps and scars from beatings, from whippings. All right, so, so how are we going to make this a positive thing? How are Southerners going to make slavery positive? Well, in, in part, they're going to use something called the Second Great Awakening. The same Second Great Awakening that uh, inspired abolition in the North is ironically going to inspire pro-slavery in the South. So those uh, religious revivals that broke out in upstate New York also break out in places like Kentucky, where in Cane Ridge, quote, the noise was like that of the roar of Niagara, Niagara Falls. The vast sea of human beings seemed to be agitated as if by a storm. I counted seven ministers, all preaching at one time. All these people were going nuts. Well, what do they argue? Remember, Second Great Awakening said all people had a soul, right? They really pushed that idea of evangelicalism even further. But what about slaves? So what are, how is the South going to make this understood? 
As one Baptist minister who was also a slave owner said, when I consider that slaves are human creatures indeed, with immortal souls capable of everlasting happiness or liable to everlasting misery, as well as ourselves, it filled my mind with horror and devastation. In other words, slaves have souls that can be saved too. Um, so I need to make sure that they have access to religion. If you look at this image over here, here's a slave master, his wife and children, and here is a slave preaching to the other slaves. The key is you have to control the message. You have to use religion as a way to remind slaves that that they are being taken care of, that they are, are being protected by their master who is giving them um, religion, who is helping to save their souls. One slave later remembered that his white uh, master, a white minister, gave a sermon and when he said, quote, how good God was in bringing us over to this country from dark and benighted Africa and permitting us to listen to the sound of the gospel. In other words, your white master, your white owner has given you religion and he has saved your soul, which you, you know you, is a very interesting way to look at it. By interesting, I mean kind of screwed up. So this positive good is going to use slavery, use religion to defend slavery. For example, in the Old Testament, align servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. A slave master is going to hear this and teach this to his servants and say, listen, God wants you to be obedient to your father, to your master. And I am on earth your father who is giving you religion, who is protecting you, who is taking care of you and allowing you to have this happy life. Now, of course, we know that there's some real problems with this argument. Mostly, um, it ignores the violence and the brutality of slavery, which we're going to talk more about. But the point being that Southerners really come to believe, not all Southerners, but many Southerners will come to believe that slaves are, are not only inferior, but it's important that, that they be taken care of in society because that's what makes the South such a, a, a remarkably wealthy and powerful place, right? Cotton needs slaves, and slaves will be the driving force, the driving engine um, behind cotton. And how do you make that all okay? Well, again, you use the positive good argument, all the different things we just talked about, to say, listen, up in the North, you, you Northerners, you abuse white workers, white women, white children, even immigrants. Here in the South, we have a permanent working class, our slaves, and we take care of them. We, we give them religion, we give them clothes, we give them shelter. Otherwise, they would be stuck in Africa or they'd be unable to take care of themselves. So who has the better society, says the South? Of course, the South believes that they do, that they have a superior society. The problem, of course, is that the North is developing its own argument against slavery and against this idea of, of having slavery within a free country. And these two societies and these two ideas are going to crash together uh, in the very near future. And we'll talk much more about that over the next few classes. Take careful notes, handwritten notes, and you can use them on the quiz.